good morning, White Flag. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Good. Well, we are so glad that you guys are here with us this morning. I know it's already been said, but we want to welcome you here. And if you're joining us online right now, thank you so much for logging in and being with us as well. Well, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Jason. I'm the discipleship pastor here. And I get the privilege of speaking or preaching the last message before Pastor Paul returns in a week, right? You guys excited about that? What's really cool is the staff this week, we kind of been joking off and on that the rest of us are going to take three months off now that he's back so that we can, I'm I'm kidding, I'm kidding. We are very, very thankful that Paul is going to be back next week. We're praying that God has done an incredible work in his life and Julia's life over the last three months, which seems to have just flown by, actually. But we hope that God will continue to fill them up and recharge them in these last couple days. And we want you guys to keep praying for them as well. So, again, that's next week. We're excited for them to be back. But this week, I want to tell you about a time several years ago when I was, before I was on staff here, I took a job as a freelance kind of part-time thing. And my job was with a company that did Facebook fact-checking. Now, no, I was not the one who put you in Facebook jail because you shared that article that wasn't true. That was not what I did. But basically what happened was this company would send us memes and articles and videos, and my job was to go out and try to find two other sources that either backed up that article or maybe ran contrary to the article. And sometimes it was really easy. I mean, it was really, really simple. Some, they would get a picture or a meme, and we'd be like, oh, obviously fake, like this one. Let's go ahead and put this first picture up here. Oh, I cut it off. It says, everything on the internet, everything I read on the internet is true. Abraham Lincoln, 1958. If you don't know why that's fake, the rest of this message may be a challenge for you, all right? And so sometimes things like this are just obviously, obviously fake. And then there were times that there may be a little bit of truth, and it made it a little more difficult for people to actually decipher whether it was true or not, like this picture. I'm going to put this next one up there. Maybe. I guess we're not getting that picture today. Anyways, so there was a picture that circulated on the internet for a while, and it was a picture of a mega church that a lot of people like to kind of rail against. They like to take down, put shots at. Hey, we finally got the picture. But so anyways, they put this picture out online, and if you can't tell, there's a baptistry there and a water slide going into the baptistry. Now, I think that looks a lot of like a lot of fun, but People got upset because how dare they make a mockery of all this? How dare they put something like this in their church? Because people didn't like, don't like this church a lot. Well, here's the problem. That photo is not real. That photo is Photoshopped. It actually was from a satire site called the Babylon Bee. If you guys have ever read anything from the Babylon Bee, their job is to just make fun of and poke fun at all sorts of things. Now, Once people knew it was from the Babylon Bee, you would think that this would have stopped, right? People wouldn't share it anymore. But about a month ago, in a group that I'm a part of on Facebook, this picture came up and somebody was, again, how dare they do this? And I'm like, this was four years ago and it was fake the whole time. And so people keep sharing things like this. But one of the biggest challenges when you read things, whether online or other places, is that even when it's a lie, even when it's made up, Sometimes it's difficult to decipher if it's real or not because they wrap it in just enough truth to make you think what they're saying is real. And it's not just news media or social media or anything else where this happens. This happens when it comes to faith as well. For you and I, it should be a simple thing for us to determine whether or not it's Christianity or maybe Islam, Christianity or Buddhism. We should be able to decipher the difference between the two. But what happens when it's a Christianity that preaches the gospel and Christianity that perhaps preaches that health, wealth, and prosperity kind of gospel. It gets a little more challenging sometimes to decipher between those two things. And whether you know it or not, believing in the false gospel that's teached in a lot of places can be a problem because what we believe, our doctrine determines how we behave. And Jesus knows these two things cannot be separated. Whether it's, if it's a false belief, your actions will often be false actions. True belief leads to real actions. Now, as we wrap up this series we've been in called Red Letter Life, and we've been looking at the words of Jesus, the red letters in your Bible, we've been focusing on the Sermon on the Mount. That's where we've been camping most of this entire six weeks, right? And we didn't even get all of the things 
in the Sermon on the Mount into the series. And as we've been going through this, I wish that when Jesus ended the Sermon on the Mount, that he ended it with this rah-rah kind of speech. You know that speech that maybe your coach gave you in high school or your theater or band director, that one that got you all pumped up and you ran out onto the field or the court or on stage, whatever it may be, and you were all pumped up and ready to go and you knew that you were going to win the game because you were so excited. I wish Jesus ended the Sermon on the Mount that way. But Jesus does not end the Sermon on the Mount that way. In fact, much like Jeremiah's message last week, Jesus actually lays out a pretty big challenge for us as we wrap up the Sermon on the Mount. As Jesus is doing this, he's essentially telling his disciples, listen, I have taught you what it looks like to be my disciple, what it looks like to do life in the kingdom. I've told you that I'm the promised one. Now the question is, what are you going to do with what I've shared with you? How are you going to work on what I've given you to work on? And he's trying to remind them, listen, It is easy to deceive yourselves and be deceived by other people as to what you listen to and what you follow and what you do. Jesus is reminding, listen, there are eternal consequences to the way you live your life. There are consequences to what you believe and to what you do. And so Jesus actually lays out four different statements right at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that we're going to look at today. And they're really challenges to us or questions we need to answer If you were here a few weeks ago when I said something about if Jesus ever says woe to you, then you should pay attention to what he's saying, essentially that's what Jesus does in these four questions. So the first question Jesus asks is, will you take the narrow road? Will you take the narrow road? In Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus says this, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few will find it. Now, as Jesus moves into the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he's giving us this warning about what does it look like to be on the right path when it comes to following God. If you remember all the way back in the very first week of this this series, we talked about the Beatitudes. I know that seems like an eternity ago now, but that very first week, we talked about the Beatitudes. And we talked about how Jesus laid out what it looks like to be his follower, and all these statements ran contrary to what the world normally thinks. They didn't make much sense if we thought about it the way the world thinks about it. Think about the very first one when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That doesn't make sense the way the world thinks. And over the weeks that went after that, we talked about how Jesus said, you have heard it said, but I say to you, Jesus continues to try to flip life on its head, to turn things upside down, to show how, man, this is a different kind of life that I've come to give you. This entire series, we've talked about this, and Jesus then gets to the statement, he says, my way is not the broad way, it's not the wide way, it isn't like the way the world thinks, it isn't living like the rest of the world. The Beatitudes are not easy. Dealing with lust in our life, not easy. Being a person of integrity is not easy. Having a great prayer life isn't easy. And then judging other people the way that God calls us to judge them, that's not easy either. All of these things are much more challenging than the world would have us live. Yet these are exactly what Jesus says that life and his kingdom are going to look like. And he doesn't leave room for you and I to have our own opinions And say, well, you know what, Jesus, I'll take a little bit of this. I want the joy and the happiness that come with it, but I don't want to do the hard work. Jesus, I'm okay with this statement, but I'm not okay with that statement. Jesus essentially says, listen, this is how it's all going to look. The way that you're going to follow me, man, it, it is a narrow path. Now, I know as soon as I start talking about this narrow path, some of you are thinking, oh, no, here we go, one of those preach your messages about sucking the fun out of life, right? About not having any joy in life. But here's the honest truth. I think the truth about all of this is the joy that we find in following Jesus and taking the narrow path is greater than the joy we find in the world, even if in the moment it doesn't really feel that way. In fact, Jesus actually says that anybody who follows him, man, they're going to receive so much much more 
as a reward for following him than they could have ever experienced living like the world. Look at what Jesus says in Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30. He says, truly I tell you, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Jesus is saying, listen, that, that reward that you get, that reward you get for walking the narrow path, and that is so much greater than anything you could have possibly imagined. In that original statement, when Jesus says that the people that take the narrow road and the narrow gate, man, they're going to inherit life. They're going to get life. But people that take the broad and wide road, the road the world takes, man, they are headed towards destruction. And it shouldn't be a surprise to us that most people will never take the narrow road. Because it's more challenging, it's more difficult, it's not as easy as just trying to blend into the world around us. It shouldn't surprise us that the narrow road is not filled with a ton of people, it's not crowded. Almost everybody takes the wide, the broad, the easy road. But Jesus says, listen, if you want to follow me, you've got to take the narrow road. Now one of the hardest parts about teaching a message like this is that we live in a society that is comparison-based. We like to compare ourselves to other people. When it comes to following Jesus, we think, you know what? I bet my neighbor up the street, man, I'm much better than he is. I I don't drink as much. I don't yell at my kids the way he does. I don't scream at them. I don't get angry with my wife the way he does. I give a little bit. I tithe a little bit. I do those, those little things. I mean, I'm so much better off than he is. And we think somehow that means that we're closer to following Jesus than, than that other person. And so we had this comparison game because we want to fit in. We want to look like everybody else, right? But when I was younger, when I would get in trouble when I'm out with a group of friends, my parents would ask the question, why did you do that? And my answer would be along as well, because this person was doing it and I just wanted to fit in with them. And so I just went along with the crowd. And then my parents said something to me that I'm pretty sure a lot of your parents probably said to you. Well, if that person jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge too? Right? And my answer to that was, well, no, of course not. That's ridiculous. That doesn't make any sense. I just wanted to fit in with everybody. And, but now as a parent, I start to think, oh, I, I understand you a little bit better. But Jesus, essentially, what he's saying is, listen, I'm showing you what this narrow path is. I'm showing you what it looks like to walk this narrow path. I don't care if everybody else takes that broad road, that wide road, do you want to go to your death with them? Are you going to just do that because all your friends are doing that? Or or are you going to make the choice that leads to life? And then so Jesus continues asking these questions. And the next question he asked is, is the fruit rotten? Is the fruit rotten? In Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20, he says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree that bears fruit, good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Every time I read that passage, I think of the scene from The Princess Bride when he goes, you think, but I think, that he thought, you know, that passage gets a little confusing right there. But anyways... One of the things about working in a a church setting is that over the time, you follow other pastors and other ministries to see what they're doing, to see how the programs they're putting in place are working. How are they leading people to Christ? And so you start following some of these other churches, and you start watching what they're doing. You kind of admire them from afar. But inevitably, what seems to happen far too often is that this church that looked like everything was going fine, it looked like it was going great, you find out that the pastor has this incredible fall from grace, this in te- incredible like, downfall in their life. And you start to wonder, man, how does that happen? How does that public persona not match what's on the inside? How does it not look the same? But this isn't really a new phenomenon. I mean, in fact, Jesus, when he's teaching this message to his disciples, 
This is the exact same thing that's happening with the Pharisees. This is the thing that he sees going on in the Jewish culture in that time. The Pharisees looked like they had it all together, looked like they had it all figured out, but man, too far, too, far too often, people were actually worried about their own control, their own pride, their own prestige, and less about actually leading people into a relationship or to a life with God. And so Jesus makes a big point of pointing out the importance of listening to true teachers, not getting led astray by false teachers. In fact, as I was getting ready for this message, I knew that Jesus made a point of it several times, but I had no idea how many times in the New Testament either Jesus or Peter or Paul make a comment about a warning about falling into a trap of listening to and following false teachers. And so I just want to read you a few verses this morning where Jesus and Peter and Paul actually warn against this. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 11, Jesus says, And many false prophets will appear and deceive my, many people. It was an issue as well for Paul, and he warns the church in Ephesus. In Acts 20, 29-31, he says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth and in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Or consider what Peter says. In 2 Peter 2, verses 1 through 3, he says, But there are also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you and fabricate stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. And one more from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. He says, For such people are false prophets, are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Jesus. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. So how do we discern, how do we know the difference between somebody who's teaching the actual gospel and somebody who's twisted it for their own benefit? And let's be clear, I'm not talking about a pastor who makes a mistake in something they say once in a great while. Because here's the truth, all of us on staff, whether it's Paul, myself, Jeremiah, Titus, Steve, anybody who gets up here to teach a message, we do the very best we can to make sure we stay as true to the gospel as we possibly can. But I would promise if you asked any of us, at some point we'd probably say, at some point maybe we said something that maybe looking back we would have changed how we said it because maybe it didn't come out quite right or maybe for whatever reason our view has changed. I'm talking, not talking about those people. I'm talking about those teachers who do not actually teach the gospel at all. Now, I'm sure if you've been around Christian circles for a while, you can come up with a list of names. A list of names of people you think are false teachers, people that are leading people astray, and you can go down that road. And I know you'd love for me to just give you a list of those people, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that for one reason, one big reason. Because in our culture, calling somebody a false teacher has become the Christian version of cancel culture, right? We were talking about this as a staff the other day where people like to throw out this label of false teacher. If you don't like a church or something, you don't like a particular pastor, oh, must be a false teacher. Their church is growing faster than ours and you don't understand why. Oh, they must be teaching that false gospel, not the real thing. They have a worship team that you don't like because, they, I mean, people love their music. Oh, must be false, or false doctrine in that song. That can't be right. They, you have all these reasons we start going through and saying, listen, we don't like something about that church, so they must not be teaching the gospel. And so as Christians, we use that as a way to kind of put people down. And so I'm not going to list a list of names, but I want to give you some ideas of what you can do to determine whether who you're listening to or what you're reading is the actual gospel, is a good teacher, or is it maybe a false teacher. And Jesus is actually calling us to learn to discern the difference between the two. Several years ago, when my youngest son was really, really, really little, like even as a baby, he hated carrots. Actually, he still hates carrots, but he hated carrots. 
And we would get the baby food, you know, the blended up stuff that has carrots in it, and we'd put it in his mouth and instantly, everywhere, every single time. To the point, even as he got older, we would dice up carrots and put them in mashed potatoes, and he would we'd put the mashed potatoes in his mouth, and he'd chew, and all of a sudden, at the end of the little bite, and he'd spit out all the pieces of the carrot. And I'm like, I don't know how you do that. So my wife tried even blending, like grinding up carrots and putting them in meatballs when we were eating like pasta or something. He took one bite, spit it back out. Oh, this has carrots in it. How do you even know? How do you know? I mean, like he knew the second that there were carrots in something. He just absolutely hated them. And I tell you that story because as funny as that is, that's a picture of what Jesus wants us to do when it comes to listening to false teachers or false prophets. That when we take something in, we should immediately be like, no, that is not, that is not the gospel. That's not the truth. I'm not listening to what they say anymore. I'm, I won't put that in my mind. I won't dwell on that. And so how do we discern if a person is teaching the false gospel or not? In the, is the, here's a couple things you can think of. Is the message they're teaching the narrow path? Is the message they're teaching the real narrow path? Or are they just teaching, you can do whatever you want, whenever you want, and you can get away with it, it's fine. Are they teaching a poverty of spirit, a need and a dependence for God in, their, in your life? Is that teacher teaching a need for God's mercy? Are they teaching you that following Jesus should make you look so different from the world around you that you should be facing persecution in your life? Are they teaching you the warm and fuzzy parts of the gospel? Are they just teaching you the Jesus loves me part and then they skip all the other parts of the gospel about repentance and all the other things that we don't like to talk about, the uncomfortable parts? Does that teacher sound more like a self-help guru with a little bit of Bible literature thrown into it? Did you pick up a book where there's maybe 10 verses of scripture in the entire book and it's really more, if you took those out, it would just sound like everything on the self-help shelf. Those are some ways you can start to think about, man, if that's what it sounds like, if that's what it looks like, then the red flag should start to go up about whether or not that person is a false teacher or not. But another way that we can determine whether or not somebody is a false teacher is exactly what Jesus says. Jesus actually says, that you should know a false teacher by the fruit that they're producing. He talks about how one type of fruit can look like another from a distance, but when you get up close, man, it is totally, totally different. In fact, in Jesus' day, and even to this day to some extent, there's, there's this bush that produces a grape-like fruit, but it's on a thorn bush. And from a distance, you would swear it's a grape until you got up and maybe you saw the plant it was on, and you would know, no, that's not a grape bush. That's not a grapevine. That's something else. And especially if you ever took a bite of it, you would know. And the same that goes with the fig that he was talking about. There's a thistle that produces a fruit that looks just like a fig. And again, from a distance, you would think, man, that's a fig. That's good. It's no problem. But the truth is, as soon as you saw it up closer, you took a bite, you would know. And that's not real. Again, when it comes to those false teachers out there, those guys that are teaching a gospel that just isn't the truth. From a distance, they may look fine. But man, investigate a little deeper and you'll start to realize, man, this, whatever this is, this is not the gospel. This is not following Jesus. And again, I'm not talking about pastors who make a mistake. Pastors are human. We make mistakes. We say things sometimes we would wish that we hadn't said. You know, we're not perfect. But again, I'm talking about those guys who say one thing, but their life is in total rebellion to the gospel, that in reality, the way they're living looks nothing like what Jesus is calling us to live. I'm talking about those guys that are more concerned with power and money and influence, those type of things. That person that's more concerned about the attendance number in their church because of what it represents as far as prestige when they go to a conference and they're talking to some of their other buddies and like, well, our attendance is 5,000 people and our offering is this. And that's their motivating thing. They're so excited about that number. And again, there's nothing wrong with the big attendance. There's nothing wrong with any of that. It's when it becomes the motivation for your pride and your prestige, instead of seeing people, seeing that number as the number of people who are coming to know who Jesus is. You need to be on the lookout for those people that are more concerned about the money they're bringing in than they are the actual souls that are being saved. 
So Jesus warns us to be on the lookout for those type of people. Let me make a point that Jesus, is, as he's talking to his disciples, I think is important for us. And that's this. And if you're looking for false teachers, I think you should be discerning about false teachers, but don't make it your goal in life to go out and hunt down every false teacher out there. Believe it or not, I know people, and I know there are multiple websites out there that will watch tons of messages, and they'll wait to find one sentence out of an entire message that they think a person is a false teacher for, and they try to make this big deal of it online, or they like to call out false teachers. Listen, you should be discerning. But Jesus did not call you to be the false teacher police for every other person out there. You be discerning. You teach others to be discerning. Teach them, the people that you're listening to or you're watching, to help them know who are better teachers to listen to and watch. And so Jesus, again, cautions us about false teachers, but then he jumps to the next question. Are you ready to listen? Are you ready to listen? Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. I remember as a kid, the very first time I heard that passage, I kind of went into a panic attack, thinking, how do I know? How do I know whether Jesus is going to look at me and say, man, you're good, or is he going to look at me and say, nope, get away from me, you evildoers, because if you notice in the passage, Jesus doesn't call them liars. He doesn't say that they didn't do all these things. He doesn't say they didn't drive out demons in his name or prophesy or anything else. He doesn't say anything about that. He just says, get away from me, you evildoers. How do I know whether or not I'm in the group that's okay or the group that Jesus says, get away from me? So what makes it so some people are accepted by Jesus and some are not? Is it going to church every week? Is it attending every event at church? Is it being in a small group? Is it memorizing scripture? Is it giving enough money? Is that what earns your way into heaven? The truth is, all of those things are important. All of those things are important, but they're not the thing. The thing Jesus is really looking for in your life is obedience. Obedience to the will of the Father. Now, please don't misunderstand me. You are not saved by your obedience. You are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and that's, that is it, right? But a life that is marked by grace should be a life that is marked by obedience as well. If Jesus really has done that work in your life, you should be so filled with the grace that Jesus has given you that you should want in every way that you can to be obedient to what he's calling you to in life. And when we don't view God's grace as something that requires us to be obedient, what happens is it leads to, and it's a phrase that, you know, I don't like using this phrase, but it leads to something called cheap grace. Cheap grace teaches us that forgiveness without repentance is fine. Cheap grace says, listen, you can say, God, forgive me for this sin and have no intention of changing, no intention of doing anything different, and you just keep going on with your life the way you always have, thinking God will just keep forgiving and forgiving and forgiving. And while God does continue to forgive, he also calls you to repentance, to change how you're living your life. And when you don't think about that, when you don't do that, that is a cheap form of grace. Cheap grace also says that you can be a disciple without being obedient which means you can get in the water, you can say the confession and change nothing about your life and say that that's absolutely fine. But when you are marked by that grace, there should be a change that you are seeing in your life, that your life should look different from the moment you got out of the baptistry to the moment you're in now. Your life should have changed because of what God is doing in your life. Cheap grace says that God says you're going to be happy and you're going to have all the things you want all of your life, and that's how things will go, even though the gospel is plain that, man, we're going to have trouble in life. Cheap grace also says that people, again, will get whatever they want, and a lot of people in a lot of churches, they teach that all the time. There are people who make a career out of teaching that cheap grace kind of gospel, but that is not what Jesus says. He says, listen, 
Following me is a narrow path. And that narrow path and being on it is a matter of obedience to the will of the Father. Surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus in everything that we do. Not in a a way that says, man, I'll surrender to Jesus in this way, but I'm not going to give him uh, control over my finances. I'll surrender to Jesus in this part of my life, but when it comes to going out and partying every weekend and doing the things that maybe I maybe shouldn't go that far, I don't want to give him that part. The narrow path in obedience says you have to give him the lordship in everything in your life. And so finally, Jesus gets to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. The very last thing he talks about, the very last question he poses us, to us is this. Will you still be standing? Will you still be standing? Matthew 7, 24 through 27 says this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down and the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now I hope as I'm reading that to you, you're understanding that Jesus is talking about if you're building your life in obedience to the Father, that you're surrendering to Jesus in everything, and you're listening to his word, and you're taking that in, and you're growing, you are building your house on a firm foundation. And when the storms of life come, because, again, I've told you, the gospel says they will come. No matter what we want to believe, the storms will come. You may get beat up, you may get bruised, but your foundation and your faith is strong enough to keep you standing even in the midst of those storms. But Man, if you're one of those people that maybe at one point you said a few words, you got into the waters of baptism, but you haven't really developed a relationship with God, and what's going to happen is that when the storms of life come, And again, they will. You're going to get thrown right off of your foundation. The house will collapse. I have seen this more times, unfortunately, than I can count while doing ministry. People who claim to follow Jesus, who say they follow Jesus, and the first sign of trouble in their life, they throw their hands up and say, well, Jesus did nothing for me. Jesus didn't fix this problem. He didn't deal with this problem, and so I'm done. And they walk away from Christianity. They walk away from following Jesus because they never had a foundation that was firm. And as soon as that storm came, again, it just swept their feet right out from underneath of them. And so Jesus poses the question to all of us, listen, will you build your foundation on a firm rock foundation, on my truth, or are you gonna try to live life the way that you've always lived life and make no substantial changes to the way you're going, and as soon as that storm comes, get swept away? Listen, Jesus says in John 10, 10, he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, right? He says, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And he says that because even in this life, when we're struggling with whether or not we want to follow the narrow, narrow road, do we want that kind of life or do we want the life the world has to offer? Jesus is saying, listen, the life that I'm promising you is far greater far greater than anything this world has to offer you. And I don't think it's a coincidence that so many people in this world, they try to follow the path of the world. They try to do what the world says you should do, and what they end up feeling is unfulfilled, let down, depressed, sad, broken, all of those things that so many people feel in this world. I don't think it's a coincidence that they feel that Because that's not the life that Jesus intended. The way this world lives, this is not the life that Jesus intended. Jesus intended the life that is found at the end or on the path of the narrow road. And so he's encouraging you, listen, I I know it's a challenge. I know it's tough. But man, take the narrow road. The reward at the end is far greater than anything you're giving up. So how do we learn to be obedient right now? How do we learn to take some steps to learn to start being obedient to God right now? And these are simple things, and it's a short list. It's not this fully exhaustive list out there, but these are just a few things. First, start your day with prayer. Start your day with prayer, and I know, I know that in the midst of everything going on, you may try to say, well, 
Do you know how busy I am in the morning? Do you know how hard it is in the morning to get everything going? And you wanna, we can throw up all the excuses, but here's the thing. If your kids are virtual schooling right now, you better start your day with prayer because you're going to need it by the end of the day, right? All jokes aside, man, don't get out of bed for three, like three to five minutes and just lay there and say, all right, God, help me with this day. Tell God what you know you already have on your plate going into the day and ask God to be with you each step of the way. Take that morning to surrender the day to God and say, listen, God, I, I don't know how I'll make it through this day without your help. But make it a point to start that way. Here's another thing. Pick a verse. Pick a verse out of the Bible, write it down on a three-by-five card or a piece of paper, and I mean, like, physically write it down. And I say that because I'm the person that would copy and paste it and paste it into something and then totally forget what I wrote. There's something about writing out that verse that helps you get that into your head. Well, pick that verse, whether it's every day or a couple of weeks, and dwell on that verse. Think about that verse throughout the day and ask God to speak to you about what he's wanting you to learn in the midst of that verse. Third, journal. And this is what I'm trying to get better at. Man, write down your prayers and your conversations, what you think God is trying to say to you in the midst of your time with God, your quiet time with God. And I tell you this because what happens when we don't journal is that God often will change things and God will answer the prayers, but sometimes it takes longer than we're willing to wait. And so we forget that we even ever prayed that prayer and don't remember that God has followed through, that God has come through. And so when you write it down in a journal, you can look back days, weeks, months, or years later and say, man, I cannot believe what God did over this course of time. I would have missed it if not for the fact that I got to look back and see that I prayed for that a year ago and God answered that prayer. So journal, it's a great way to start being obedient to God because you start seeing how faithful he is. Fourth, pray throughout your day. Yes, it's another prayer part of this. But don't just reserve your prayer time for morning, bedtime, and maybe the meals in between. Prayer is a constant conversation with God. That means, you know, you, you get to work and you're like, man, I gotta go have a conversation with this coworker. God, help me be with, or be with me so that you can guide me in what I need to say and how to say it. God, it's been a rough day. People have not been great at, at work and Man, I, I just need you to be with me. Your prayer doesn't have to be this 15 or 20 minute conversation every time. It can be one sentence, it can be one question to God, but continuously throughout the day, remind yourself to ask for God's help. Offer it up to God, because when you start to do that, you start to see how God has it under control, and the more he, you see how he has things under control, the more obedient you become to the Father. The fifth one. Watch what you consume. And this is a big one. Watch, yes, the teachers, and the, maybe if you're listening to sermons, or you're watching videos, watch what you consume in that way. Watch what you consume maybe on TV or through a movie. Yes, watch those things. But what I'm really talking about is we live in a day and age right now where at every turn there's so much negativity and so much fighting and so much bickering with people. And when you get focused on looking at all those things on social media about how people are fighting back and forth and you get this all in your head, you get so distracted with the fights and everything else that's going on in the world, it is virtually impossible for you to listen for God. So in other words, shut it down. Just If that is a distraction for you, just turn off the social media. Don't go on there. Don't engage in those conversations. Don't engage in the fighting and the bickering to the point that you lose focus on God. Instead, put your focus squarely on God and learn to trust that the rest of that, he has under control. It's not your issue to deal with. That's God's issue to deal with. Let him do that, and you focus on your relationship with God. And so over this last six weeks, man, we have looked at how Jesus laid out what does it look like to be his disciple? What does it look like to follow him? And as we wrap up this series, man, I hope you have seen the life that Jesus wants you to live. I hope you have seen the way that, you, that Jesus wants you to go about your life. And so I want to leave you with these two challenges. If you were baptized a long time ago, and you confessed your faith in Jesus, but your life is not significantly different than it was then, Today's the day you say, God, I want to be obedient to you. 
And you immediately start to put into action things to help you be more obedient to his lordship. That you start to trust him more. So that your life continues to change the way he wants you to change. Second, if you would call yourself a Christian, but you've never made a decision to be baptized, today's the day that you should do that as well. Because how do you hope to be obedient to anything else God wants you to do when the very first thing Jesus says that you should be obedient to is to confess and then be baptized? It's the first thing he asks. So if you've never made that choice, but you call yourself a Christian, do not leave here without talking to one of our pastoral staff or coming down here to talk to me, and we will get that arranged for you right now. But that is a big step in what it means to be obedient to Christ. But for all of us, man, I hope you see that this red-letter life that Jesus has laid out and the joy that you find, can find there is well beyond anything this world has to offer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for your son. We thank you for the Sermon on the Mount, the words of Jesus that teach us what it's like to be a disciple. What does it look like to follow him? God, my prayer for everyone in the room is that we would learn to be obedient to you in all things, holding nothing back, so that on the day when we get to heaven, Jesus looks at us and tells us to welcome, tells us to come in, and doesn't tell us to get away because we followed him in name and word only, but our faith, our actions didn't match what we were claiming to believe. God, we just, again, we thank you for the wisdom that Jesus gives us in this Sermon on the Mount. But more than anything, God, we thank you for Jesus' sacrifice. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next week when Paul returns.